Okay, we are going to go ahead and get started. Um, thank you all so much for joining today. My name is Kelly Van Beveren. I'm a Senior Policy and Communications Associate at Achieve. And welcome to our webinar on the new Cognitive Complexity in Science Framework. We're excited that you're here and excited to dig into this exciting new framework. Um, a few pieces of housekeeping just before we get started. Um, we, because we're so excited that so many of you are here, but because there are so many folks on, um, we ask that you please keep yourself muted to cut down on background noise if at all possible. Um, you should have been automatically muted as you joined, but you can unmute yourself if you'd like to, uh, but please keep yourself muted um, during all other times. And um, we also do have a chat feature in Zoom where you can feel free to drop your questions uh, for the presenters and, and for fellow participants. So feel free to use the chat feature. And we are recording this webinar and we'll be posting it on the Achieve website alongside the frameworks themselves. So if you have to drop off early or if you have a colleague who wasn't able to join, uh, they will be able to view the recording of this webinar soon. So with that, I am going to turn things over to Anisha, TJ, and Marai to get us started. Thanks, Kelly. Um, hi, everyone. I hope you're all doing really well today. Um, thank you so much for um, joining our webinar this, um, this afternoon. Today we're going to talk about a new framework for approaching cognitive complexity in three-dimensional assessment tasks. We invite you throughout the course of the webinar as well as um, after the fact to um, share your thoughts with us, drop questions and reactions to the framework um, that you're having onto Twitter um, as well as into the chat box. If you share them on Twitter, um, please tag us and use the hashtag AssessNGSS. We're really hopeful that we'll be able to continue engaging this conversation over time um, after this webinar is finished today. Um, as Kelly mentioned, uh, the web this webinar is going to be led by myself, Anisha. I am the Director for Special Initiatives at Achieve, and you um, may have interacted with me because I uh, lead the science assessment work at Achieve. I was really lucky to be able to collaborate with my dear friend and collaborator, um, Mirai Takamura-Kisa, who is a professor at Florida State University, um, and a great deal of this work is based on work that um, she pioneered uh, prior to our efforts at the summative assessment level. Um, and we'll also be joined by TJ Smolik, the science um, person in Michigan. Um, TJ has done a wealth of work on science assessments um, broadly, but also thinking about how to use this complexity framework in her context within her assessment system. So we'll be thinking more together about um, how we can apply this in specific contexts. So our goals for the webinar today are first and foremost to introduce a new framework for evaluating cognitive complexity to you. We hope that after this webinar, you will go ahead and um, download the document if you haven't done that already, read it over, think about how you may use this and what questions you have and engage with us further. Um, we wanna share some initial ideas for how the framework can be used in both state and local um, summative assessment systems. And we wanna dive into one example, the example of Michigan, of how a state is actually using this framework to support their statewide summative assessment development processes um, along with other coherent aspects of their assessment system. So to kick us off, um, before we dive into the nitty gritties of the framework itself, we wanted to briefly address why we even felt the need to develop a new framework. So as most of you I'm sure know, um, several years ago, a framework for K-12 science education was released and it really revolutionized what we wanted to see from students as far as their science learning and performance in the K-12 system. With new st standards came new goals and new assessments. And a great deal of my work over the past several years, as well as the work of many, many, many people in the field has been to figure out what it looks like to assess these new standards that sort of lie at the intersection of three equally important complementary um, dimensions centered on making sense of phenomena and problems. As we were diving into both um, the assessment development work as well as several other related projects, there are some key differences in three-dimensional standards relative to more traditional standards that really drove a lot of the decision-making for our process. First, three-dimensional standards um, 
sort of require that students both develop and demonstrate their understanding uh, and ability to do science in the context of figuring out problems and phenomena. And this is in contrast to sort of learning isolated facts or procedures or skills. Um, through the course of developing progressions that build towards three-dimensional standards, we know that teaching and learning has to follow an arc that is grounded in developing increasingly sophisticated sense-making routines. And this is in contrast to sort of learning content first and then doing all of the sense-making at the end as the application aspect of things. And finally, um, one of the hallmarks of three-dimensional standards are indeed the three dimensions and their use together. And this introduction of disciplinary core ideas, science and engineering practices, and cross-cutting concepts as equally important complementary strands of science education um, was really rather unique to new science standards and posed interesting opportunities and challenges when it came to designing science assessments. And so through all of the work that sort of came into um, developing new approaches to assessment, a major distinction emerged between traditional science standards and new science standards, and this focused on sense making. Sense making for all students at all times in their learning progression, um, and developing increasingly sophisticated sense making over time as sort of the arc of learning as opposed to knowing and then applying or knowing and then doing. However, traditional approaches to science assessments um, often run counter to um, the kinds of signals we want to be sending about how we want students to be learning and demonstrating their understanding. And so if you think about what traditional approaches to um, complexity have looked like, and by, by extension, science assessments, we often think of um, the simple performances as asking students to tell us that they know something, give us a definition, give us an idea, give us isolated facts, or show us that they can do something. Do you know how to label graphs? Do you know how to um, interpret a plot that is provided to you? And then at increasing levels of sophistication, we have them bring those things together and actually apply their science ideas through um, some kind of scientific skill set. If we think about sophistication of thinking growing from these isolated pieces to more integrated pieces, this signals some, um, some things we don't want to see in teaching, learning, or assessment. It signals that students should learn facts and ideas first and then apply them later. It signals that students should learn ideas and practices separately and then learn to apply them together later. It suggests that sense making um, using ideas and practice is only for very advanced students at advanced levels of thinking. And this is just not what we want to see in three dimensional teaching, learning or assessment. However, because traditional cognitive complexity um, metrics as well and as a, um, as a result, science assessment approaches sort of follow that approach, we found that there is a fundamental misalignment between the expectations for three-dimensional learning and performance and what traditional approaches to cognitive complexity in science assessments both signal and drive when it comes to assessment design. And we know that assessment design and implementation is a critical factor in moving educational systems. So we were really concerned about this misalignment that we saw. Over the past several years, a ton of work has been done to define what alignment looks like for NGSS assessments. And it's really, really been focused on how do we think about the three dimensions contributing to sense making or figuring out related to phenomena or problems. Um, but it became incredibly clear as states and districts and teachers were developing assessments that if we continue to use approaches to complexity that don't build on sense making and how we know students develop their thinking in science, we will continue to have misaligned assessment development. And fundamentally, we will have tasks that are, do not support all students in achieving our shared vision for science education. And so this was really the fundamental driver in trying to think about how do we establish cognitive complexity systems that build on student sense making with the three dimensions um, to drive our thinking about more and less complex tasks. So to, um, to guide us through our thinking about the development of this framework and what the framework actually looks like, I am so excited to invite my colleague and friend, um, Rai, to, um, to, to introduce herself 
and to um, help us think about an alternative way we might approach cognitive complexity. So Mariah, I'm gonna ask you to unmute yourself and um, take us through the next slides. Just let me know when you'd like me to advance. Okay, thank you, Anisha. And hello, everyone. Thanks for joining us today. Uh, maybe I actually can start with providing a brief background on my research so that it could provide some context about uh, this collaboration. So my research broadly focuses on teachers learning and instructional improvement in science classrooms. And in most of my research efforts, uh, I really focus on supporting the design and implementation of cognitively demanding science tasks that can position students in high level thinking and sense making in classroom context. So this collaboration on the development of the complexity framework with Anisha from Achieve and input from some state leaders, including TJ, who is also with us today, has provided me the opportunity to expand my thinking about cognitive demand of science tasks into the context of summative assessments. So I find this effort timely and also exciting because it not only presents a new approach to thinking about cognitive complexity of assessments within the context of three-dimensional vision, but it also offers opportunities to support coherence for rigorous three-dimensional opportunities for students' learning and assessment across the layers of the education system from classrooms to state. So now going back to the question with which Anisha left us, it was about how to build a complex framework aligned with the three-dimensional vision. I want to start addressing this question by explaining complexity in relation to this idea of alignment for NGSS assessments. We can move to the next slide. So we consider alignment and complexity as two relations. Requirements such as commands are required to use to sense of experimental and assessment are all dimensions of the In other words, alignment judgments could only be task required within a given task. Confidences use nicely in environments by having detect the and required task. Thus, confidences require considering questions such as what is the level and kind of required of students in a given task, and how does the task require students to use each dimension to support sense making. Next slide. This new approach to complexity that we present maintains the integrity of the standards, given its focus on three dimensions and sense making. It also provides discerning information beyond the alignment judgments. And it helps to make sure all students can demonstrate what they can do and what they know. And we believe that this integrity to standards is important because as emphasized in the literature, it is critical that science assessments best represent the kind of science learning we want to see happening. As we all know from a long history of education research, instructional practices and teachers' decisions tend to be influenced by assessments. This new approach to complexity offers one possible means to support the integrity of the new standards. Next slide. Uh, one major emphasis in the recent approaches to teaching, learning, and assessment of science is science making with three dimensions. And we need approaches to the complexity that uses it as the central driver. The complexity framework that we propose is developed to capture how science making is elicited within an assessment item. Next slide. So science making is a process of building an explanation in order to figure something out. It happens when students are required in a given task to meaningfully engage in the scientific practices and use their understanding of the cross-cutting concepts and specific disciplinary ideas to address the uncertainty presented in a scenario in a given task. So the new complexity framework, next slide, that we propose uses sense making within the three dimensions as the central driver. It identifies the most critical contributions to a complex of three dimensional summative assessment tasks, and it provides mechanisms to account for features of three dimensional tasks. 
such as phenomenon-based tasks. And it builds on a cognitive demand framework for classroom-based tasks and their implementation. So just to give you a little bit background about uh, this framework, next slide. The Task Analysis Guide in Science is a research-based framework for analyzing science tasks based on their cognitive demand levels, which is about the level of thinking required of students in a given task, and the integration versus isolation of science content and practices embedded in a task. It was developed based on the consideration that tasks provide a context for students' thinking, and examining tasks provides a window into the types of opportunities provided for students' learning through curricular and instructional materials, classroom instruction, and assessment. Next slide. So it helps to assess. Next slide. So it, the, the text framework helps to assess uh, the previous one, please. Yep. <laughs> The degree to which opportunities provided for students with the tasks that they are assigned create and maintain the intellectual engagement that is conducive to students' high-level thinking and sense-making. So text has been used in developing, modifying, and analyzing instructional and curricular tasks, as well as science teaching during their enactment. And this work and the re related research base combined with Anisha's work with Achieve's state partners and their input informed the development of the complex framework for summative assessments. Therefore, the development of the complex framework was informed by research and was also driven by the needs and input from the practitioners. Next slide, please. There are four factors that contribute to the context of multidimensional assessments that we integrated into the framework. These include complexity built into the construction of a scenario or a phenomena in a given task, as well as the conceptual complexity and sophistication in the use of the practices. To decide how each of these factors scale into its contribution to complexity, we considered the degree of transfer required from the students in a given task, the level of scaffolding and support embedded within a task, and types of required applications or connections that students are uh, required to engage in in a given task, as well as the uncertainty for students to contend with. And these elements informed the development of the levels as they did in the text framework. And that's where you would actually notice some consistency between the text framework and the complexity framework to, to analyze the summative assessments. Now, Anisha walk you through a specific example and, uh, and the rubrics within the framework. Thanks so much, Mirai. Um, so as we start to think about what exactly this looks like in assessment tasks, I just want to focus your thinking a little bit about what, how the factors that contribute to complexity intersect and interact with how, how each of those factors scale. So questions that you might ask when you're thinking about how the practices or the, or the disciplinary core ideas or the cross-cutting concepts contribute to complexity. Focus on how does that dimension and how does students' engagement with that dimension contribute to the overall sense-making required by an item or a task? And so here you just see some questions that um, you might want to you might want to be thinking about asking when you're determining um, the level of complexity a question or a full task is eliciting. Um, how much transfer with regard to that dimension is being elicited? How much support are students being provided or how much do they have to sort of bring to the table? Um, how many practices are students engaging? How sophisticated is that expectation? And how much choice or decision making um, and self-regulation are students expected to bring to the task? And so these four sort of big chunks are questions we want to ask about how each dimension contributes to items and tasks, as well as how the entire um, task sort of elicits sense-making um, in a more holistic and complete way. And so if we think about assessment tasks that you're likely seeing that are aligned to the three dimensions, you've probably noticed some differences. 
Um, like the item set that is on the screen right now, which comes from the Next Generation Science Assessment Project, um, you've likely noticed that assessment tasks are no longer, well, at least they're frequently no longer, tons of standalone questions. They tend to have a central scenario with multiple questions or multiple components that contribute to an overall sense making. And so because three-dimensional summative assessment tasks um, have shifted away from sort of popcorning across multiple um, facts and procedures in isolated ways towards coherent tasks that involve multiple questions, we wanted to make sure that we had a complexity framework that would sort of be both the um, as well as the holistic task. Um, and I'll just say this, I know that um, we are, we're joined by lots of people in lots of different places and I might slip to um, regions. When I say SEP, we're managing practices, BCIs, are just their ideas, and BCCs are the same concepts. So the first set of judgments we want to be able to make on the task is judgments at the item level. So for an individual item that students are interacting with, what is the degree of complexity that the scenario, the practices, the core ideas and the cross-cutting concepts each contribute to the answer to the answer the question. Our framework is set up on a high, medium, low um, scale for each of these factors. And for every given item, an item might, um, ha might have high engagement of some of the factors and lower engagement of other factors. I want to be very clear about this. This low engagement does not mean poor engagement. It is just a, suggesting that the level of student thinking required to um, complete that question with that dimension is at a lower level of sophistication. And in summative assessments, it's really, really essential that we make sure that all learners at a variety of points along the spectrum are able to show us what they know so that we can um, provide effective feedback and next steps um, in our decisions um, to support those learners. At the item level, we want to sort of think about these four factors scaling across low, medium, and high engagement. Um, if a dimension is not engaged, it's just it's not engaged, and that um, that judgment would become be not applicable. So this would happen for every single item that um, appears in an assessment or in a task. And one of the reasons this is so important is because tasks that have high engagement of practices and um, practice-related thinking and lower engagement of content-related thinking are actually fundamentally different types of tasks than tasks that might ask students to bring a really sophisticated understanding of core ideas and a simpler understanding of practices. And so we wanna be able to um, assess the spectrum of performances that we're asking students to um, engage in. So that's the reason that we have these multiple factors and multiple um, considerations for each of those factors. In addition to that, um, when you have a task that is sort of the culmination of a series of individual questions that build toward a total sense-making experience, it's also important to be able to um, provide a holistic um, description of the complexity of the task, where you may have had some scaffolding questions early on that were lower complexity, some really deep sense-making questions later on. Um, and so in sum total, what was the level of thinking required by this task? Um, to support this, the framework includes a second set of judgments that we ask you to make about your assessment tasks that basically place the task into one of four categories. Um, these categories, scripted, low-guided integration, high-guided integration, and doing science, include the same four contributors and factors that we were talking about earlier, but sort of put them together into a holistic representation of the task. Um, in the framework document itself, if you download that, you'll see that there is the simplified versions of the tables, which is what I've shown you on this webinar, as well as much more in-depth involved versions of the tables that um, provide a lot more detail about what these things could look like in tasks. So we really encourage you to read those, to think about what that looks like in your assessment tasks, and to, um, and to come back to us with additional feedback and questions that you might have. So one of the things that we're really excited about when it comes to this framework is that different parts of the framework can be used at different points in the task design and evaluation process. So one way the framework can be used is in designing tasks and items. You can imagine um, including in specifications for a classroom task or a local or statewide um, common assessment recommendations or expectations around how you want the complexity of tasks to be varied across your assessment. 
you might decide that you want to have a wide range of holistic um, task level complexity, but within each of those tasks, keep the complexity of the items relatively consistent in some ways. You might decide you want to do exactly the opposite. Uh, you might decide that what you really you really want to make sure you have a spread of some tasks that are really um, demanding in terms of the complexity and sophistication of the core ideas that are brought to the table and others that are really um, demanding in terms of the cross-cutting concept complexity that's brought to the table. And so this framework allows you to sort of piece by piece suggest um, for designing purposes what you want to see. The other side of that coin, of course, is evaluating existing tasks. And the framework allows for um, a variety of judgments to be made about assessment items and tasks, depending on what your use or purpose um, for doing that evaluation is. And finally, something that we're really excited about is that we think the framework in conjunction with the um, alignment discussions that have been happening for the past several years can be a really useful tool to communicate um, what kinds of expectations we want to see for student learning um, and performance in the classroom, as well as in, outside of the classroom, and how that might scale. So how do we change the conversation away from content first, content and practice separate, and then if you are really great at science, you can apply it, to we want all students to be given the opportunities to engage in sense making and deepen their sense making repertoires over time. So we're really excited about the communication aspects of this tool. We want to think about what this looks like practically. Those are great ideas in theory, but um, how does this actually play out in large scale systems? And so to do this, um, we're, I'm going to ask my good friend and colleague, um, TJ Smollett from Michigan, to help us think about how Michigan has been using uh, the complexity framework or plans to use the complexity framework in their coherent assessment design. I want you, as TJ is talking, to be listening for um, these three uses that we just talked about uh, with regard to the complexity framework, how the complexity framework can be used to map the kinds of assessments you want to see, um, how it can be used in design and evaluation, and how it can support coherence within the system. So TJ, I am going to ask you to unmute yourself. Please introduce yourself, tell us a little bit about yourself, and let me know when you're ready for me to advance slides. Perfect. Thank you so much, Anisha. I really appreciate you and Mariah um, inviting me to this webinar. Thanks so much. And thank you to everyone that's here um, to hear a little bit about our story. So um, again, my name is TJ Smolik. I am the Michigan State um, Science Supervisor, and I am mostly in charge of developing the new um, large-scale assessment for the state of Michigan uh, that is based on our three-dimensional standards, which are framework-based and NGSS matched, if you will. Um, and so I'm just going to talk a little bit about, like Anisha said, our experiences with this complexity framework so far and our plans for moving forward in the future. So you can advance our slide, please. So just to provide a little bit of context, um, currently in Michigan, all of our assessments across the state, um, including everything for ELA, math, social studies, um, our alternative assessment programs, are all currently mapped to DOK when we're thinking about complexity. Um, this has been used for several years uh, across all programs in our state. And what that has provided us is ease of communication. Um, so what I mean by that is teachers, relatively speaking, teachers, districts, state level folks understand to a certain extent what depth of knowledge is, um, the verbs that are associated with those. There's been lots of uh, development as far as um, professional learning for teachers about how that can be infused in their classroom. So when we're talking about types of tasks or questions that we uh, provide students, this has created a common language for us um, and some consistency across concepts. However, when we uh, shifted to our new standards, our three-dimensional standards, we quickly realized that the depth of knowledge framework would no longer work for us. And so for a while, we were kind of just a turtle on our back saying, help me, not really sure how to get out of this mess, but um, we know we need to get out of this mess. So um, luckily, you can go ahead and advance the slide. Um, Mariah and Anisha came along and helped 
flip our turtle, if you will, uh, advance the slide. And so uh, this, this fall, we gathered a committee of shareholders um, who came together and provided some learning uh, and feedback around the cognitive complexity framework that is uh, in the links provided here. So what we did is we gathered a committee of shareholders. These were um, teachers, science education teachers, science education researchers, and science education leaders across the state of Michigan. And we spent about two days learning about the framework. And then um, Anisha was kind enough to facilitate conversation around the framework, thinking about how can we negotiate Michiganizing this uh, for the purposes of um, our entire state assessment system, thinking first about the large scale assessment because um, that's the, the first driver, what we have coming out in the state of Michigan, but then thinking about how we can move this across the entire assessment system from the state to um, formative assessments in the classroom. So you can go ahead and um, shift the slide. So some of the conversations in this process were quite interesting. Um, along with learning about the framework like uh, many of you have or are starting to do, um, we thought about a couple of things. First, how this would apply to large-scale assessments. So a few things that we're trying to work through, um, some of the verbiage around um, the doing science or the higher levels of um, complexity when it comes to items. Some of the language includes things like uncertainty. We want uncertainty around phenomenon or we want non-routine examples of something. And this becomes difficult to do on large-scale assessments for two reasons. Um, one, we need to think about how do we define what is uncertain or non-routine when we have 100,000 students per grade level taking an assessment? <laughs> that's something that's very difficult to do. And so for the state level assessments, that might look a little bit different than what you might do at a district level or even a classroom level assessment where you have more contact with what the students have learned and can determine what may or may not be uncertain um, based on their opportunity to learn. Also, when you're thinking about what's uncertain or non-routine, oftentimes these ju judgments tend to rub up against um, some of the bias and sensitivity issues we try to avoid for large-scale testing. So this is one of the um, places that we're looking at for large-scale, in particular in Michigan, how do we, or which pieces of, uh, the complexity framework can we use or how do we refine those and refine the language there to be more clear about um, being uncertain on a large-scale assessment. Um, secondly, uh, one of the themes that came out was we were often looking for clarification. So one of the um, things that we talked about with respect to the, um, the holistic rubric was uh, when there's high complexity, there's low guidance, and when there's low complexity, there's high guidance. So just thinking about how those terms interacted with one another and interacted with the particular um, sets of tasks that we were looking at, uh, we needed to provide some clarification, I think more for ourselves, about the difference between high complexity and low complexity, or high guidance and low guidance, understanding that those two things uh, were adjacent to one another. And then also, as Anisha mentioned early on in the webinar, um, really thinking about how to reduce value judgments around something that's high is good and something that's low is bad. And so one of the, um, one of the things that Anisha was able to provide for us was some language that was less value judgment based. So for example, in the Michigan version of the framework, uh, we're considering using for a low complexity when it comes to a science and engineering practice or a disciplinary core idea, instead of saying low, we might change that language to this is a space where m m uh, mechanics are foregrounded. 
um, your medium might be a place where sense making is supported and your high might be a place where independent and complex sense making is happening. And so it's more descriptive of those levels and again, takes away some of the value judgments placed on words like low and high or numbers like one, two, and three. And that's something that our committee felt was really important for folks to learn simply because we're so used to looking at an assessment and saying, oh, that's a bad assessment or oh, that's a good question. And we need to get away from that and really think about describing what's there and what's not there. Um, and so this provided some uh, context for that. And then finally, uh, other conversations that occurred were around specific cases. So um, when we were looking at particular tasks at the state level, and we found those that a student could use, say, either a, a cross-cutting concept or a DCI to complete the task. When we were trying to rate using the item analysis uh, structure or the framework, we didn't know whether to rate sense making happening or not because really you could come from two different angles on something like that. And so um, those specific cases provided a lot of opportunity for great conversation in our shareholder group. And I think it's opened up a space where more conversation um, needs to happen so that we can really shed light on our existing assessments and provide a new lens that we can consider uh, what is there and what is uh, working and what work still needs to be done on those particular cases. You can advance the slide, please. Um, so for Michigan, our, uh, our long-term plan, I guess, um, is to first uh, design the complexity framework using shareholders' input. And then from there, once we get that um, all set up, we are going to uh, apply this design for the actual item cluster development that happens at the state level. And so that will include things, um, and I'll talk about this a little bit further, but that will include all the processes that happen or, or touch, I would say, a, a item cluster or a task at the state level would incorporate the cognitive complexity framework into the thinking and application of the particular um, content that is written for those assessments. Then we would like to design a communication guide for the field so that folks can understand what's going on here, so where DOK went <laughs> and where we're going with the new cognitive complexity framework. And eventually we'd like to design classroom tools, uh, including professional learning opportunities um, and tools for teachers to use in their classrooms so that they too can use a, a cognitive complexity framework that's more rich and um, provides more information uh, for them to be able to look at their students' assessments and the progress their students are making. You can advance the slide. So the next steps for Michigan. Uh, the first thing we plan to do is back map our cognitive complexity framework onto existing item clusters. So in the state of Michigan, we have a large scale assessment for science that is item cluster based only. We have no independent items. And so our plan is to take each of these individual item clusters or tasks and back map the cognitive complexity framework onto these existing clusters. That will provide us an in, a lot of information about where we currently sit for the range of um, doing science to more scaffolded opportunities for students to show what they know and to see kind of how we're sitting in that space. Um, from there, we're going to be, this spring, we're going to be a um, revising our item development processes to include the cognitive complexity framework. So this includes revising our item cluster writing processes, including item specifications. Um, we will also be revising our processes uh, when we include content advisory committee. These are groups of shareholders that come together and look at draft tasks and determine uh, what adjustments need to be made to those tasks in order to um, pass them along to a field test position. And then also with our data advisory committee, we'll be using the, complex, the complexity framework to look at each of those items and item clusters uh, 
once they have gone through field tests and we have some psychometric data to, um, to think about uh, the validity and reliability of those particular item clusters. Again, from there, we're gonna publish some documentation so we have transparency about our processes through the field, um, develop some messaging along with that to provide coherence, and then the professional learning opportunities for teachers. And while this looks like a five-step process, where we're gonna do one of these things at a time. Likely none of these things are gonna happen independently. So hopefully as, you know, as we're developing things for the item cluster writers at the state level, those will also influence what will happen for professional learning opportunities for teachers. And I think that that provides us um, a lot of opportunity to ensure coherence across our system. So we want to ensure that um, this cognitive complexity framework is infused into every piece of our assessment system from the state developed science um, MSTEP in Michigan and to what teachers are doing and talking about and how they're speaking and providing formative assessment opportunities for their students in science. Thanks, Anisha, I'm gonna hand it back to you. Thanks, TJ. Um, I'm gonna, so we're gonna have a few minutes at the end of this webinar for some questions. So if you have questions, please drop them into the chat box. Um, TJ and Mariah, I have some questions that folks had sent to me previously, so I'm gonna ask you those in a, in a minute. But before we do that, um, I, I wanna take a moment to step back and to think about why this complexity framework um, was important to us and why we think it matters in the broader context of assessment. Assessments drive a great deal of the kinds of decision making um, that we make around student learning and performance. They also signal incredibly important things to students, to parents, to teachers, to communities about what it is that we value. So we, our goal in, in doing this work and in collaborating with the field to support this work is to make sure that we are consistently improving our assessments so that they really signal and provide feedback on what we value about student learning. Um, this framework supports that goal by building on what we know about how students learn science, um, the best research that's available on that to date, and we hope that we revise it as we learn more about how students learn. We want to, um, this framework uses sense making with the three dimensions as a central driver of how we think about uh, the level of student thinking required by tasks, which not only makes it consistent with the kinds of uh, messaging and processes that most teachers in states and districts are engaged in, um, but it also allows us to build on progress that we've been making in teaching and learning over the past several years, um, especially since the framework came out. And we hope that the framework can be used to support well-designed systems of assessment. So something that I will highlight for you here um, that you may have heard in what TJ just said is that we've talked about this framework as supportive of summative assessments, but we never said that it's only supportive of statewide summative assessments. We hope that the framework can actually help us think about what are we looking for in student learning across our classroom assessments, district assessments, state assessments, and how do those complement and remain consistent with one another? And in what ways can the framework help us do that? Um, so before we get into uh, answering some questions that you all are raising, um, I'm gonna leave you with some questions <laughs> to think about over as you sort of ponder this and download the framework and use it. I want you to think about how we can use the complexity framework in professional learning to improve teaching, learning, and assessment. And how can we use the framework to support coherence of systems of assessment? So I'm gonna leave those questions up there for you to think about while we ask a few questions of um, Mariah, TJ, and myself. Um, TJ, one question that I um, that came that came up that I want to make sure we hear from you about is why you felt the framework was a compelling support for your assessment system. So something you just told us was that you are planning on infusing it into every part of your assessment system and try, planning on making sure that it's something that um, teachers have access to and they're thinking about in different contexts. And so could you tell us a little bit about why you found this compelling in the first place? Sure, thank you. So um, one of the things that I think many of us face is 
um, assessment literacy or lack thereof issues around um, assessment literacy in our states. And so any opportunity to provide more resources and um, understanding around how the assessment system works, that it is actually a system and what data should be used for which purposes, I think is um, an opportunity that should be taken. With respect to this particular framework, um, I think what cognitive complexity allows us to do is, one of the best things I like about it is that it allows us to take the value judgment off of assessment. It's not whether an assessment is good or bad, it's what information it can provide you. And different assessments are designed to do different things. There are a lot of reasons for providing a high scaffolded assessment task for your students. And there's nothing wrong with a high, high, you know, a high scaffolding assessment task for your students. There's also the, the end goal is not always to get your students to, you know, doing science on their own by themselves, you know, like, right? that's not the end goal for us. So we need to understand this range of, um, assessment options we have. I think what the framework does is provide lens for us to evaluate what we have currently and where the holes are. A lot of our assessment systems have those big holes and we need to figure out where they're going. Um, otherwise we end up doing what uh, we end up doing things like assuming one or two or five assessments and provide all the information we need. Or we say, well this is all I have. So I have to follow inferences based on these five assessments that I have. So a tool like this to provide um, more clarity about what we have and where we need to build. That's really helpful, TJ. And I just, I, a couple of things that you said, I just want to, I want to make sure that, well, I want to say them out loud so that I know that I'm processing them well. Um, one thing that you said was that, you know, in every single assess, it's okay for some assessment items to not always be at the highest level of complexity. And I, like, this is something that I think is forever challenging in the NGSS space, because we do want students to be performing at higher levels of thinking. That's sort of one of the tenets of um, how we how we see science education changing. But what I heard you say was, I think that in an assessment, part of our goal is to figure out where kids are on their arc towards that, that ultimate goal. And so if we don't have some items and tasks that actually operate at a lower level of complexity, we will be missing part, missing out on information about some of our students and we won't be able to support them in getting to sort of like proficiency on standards or mastery or however you want to think about that. And I just, that was really profound. And so I want to thank you for, for, for sharing that. Um, yeah, absolutely. No information is no information. So if you provide all high level tasks with students that are going to master a range of tasks, you're only capturing information on a portion of those students and you have no information on the students who weren't able to successfully complete those high level tasks. So absolutely. Awesome, thank you. Um, Mariah, I have a question that I'm gonna um, put to you and I will. I'll, I might jump in at the end of this. Um, so something that we sort of uh, walked around in this webinar until this point, but someone very rightly asked the question directly is what is the relationship between our framework that we're proposing here and um, a more traditional approach like depth of knowledge. And so I'm wondering if you can say a few words about some of our thinking about how this framework uh, intersects or is different from DOK and um, how we should be thinking about that. Yeah, that's a great question. And uh, I will share some talks and feel free to jump in, Anisha. I think uh, one of the differences that uh, we have been discussing and seeing in this framework is that uh, it focuses on each dimension and how students are thinking about each dimension and how each, each dimension is contributing to sense making and making some judgments about it uh, that we do not see in some of the existing frameworks. Uh, so I think that is one difference. And the other one is uh, the, the, this focus on the sense making and then thinking about the ways in which students engage in the sense making within the context of an assessment is I think another difference that we are seeing from the existing uh, frameworks. Uh, what else? 
Do you have other things that you want to add? These are the ones that I could think of right now. Yeah, I think that the emphasis on sense making is really the critical thing. So if you think about ways that DOK, and I, I want to be clear, like DOK um, has a lot of positive things going for it. It's just difficult to marry conventional standards. Fundamental disconnect between how DOK signals sort of the increasing sophistication of student thinking going from memorization to, um, to application versus what we want students to be doing. And so the net result of that often ends up being that on a test, you see a bunch of memorization questions that kids have to, um, that the quote unquote lower level students um, will be able to do, but won't be able to do the other things. And then the net result of that is that in instruction, we tend to work on the test like that before they have to apply something. In this framework, we're really trying to push back at and emphasize that there is a different way, sense that students always communicate in simple complex ways. And that's the real sort of driver that is different, I think, between between the two um, frameworks. And one of them is, is, is more consistent with what we know about how students learn um, science and the standards and expectations around it. The one other thing that I just want to note here is that it's difficult to, um, it's difficult to argue, and I'm not trying to argue with the fact that memorization or recitation is just a simpler process than really thinking through something. And the framework doesn't suggest that that's not true. It just suggests that the way that we know where students are at relative to their learning process fundamentally has to, like, we always want kids to be in that sense-making space. We never really want to ask them questions that they would have practiced so many times that they can just memorize, because um, then we don't really know what they know. And so the complexity framework sort of um, lives, it assumes that the line of standards lives in the sense-making space, and that's what it's like, or not. So that's one thing that I would add there, um, if that sounds okay with Mariah. Yeah, that would be great. Um, one other question that we got around, um, around the, the general tool itself is how tweakable it is. So, um, for folks that are working in contexts that um, they might span multiple grade levels, they might span multiple uh, domain areas, things like that, is the complexity framework something that um, can be used uh, to support a wide range of those kinds of actions? And so I'm wondering, Mariah, if you would reflect on that first, and then TJ, if you could tell us a little bit about your experience using the framework with um, items across grade levels and domain areas. Uh, that's a great question, and I think uh, I'm thinking about the development process of the framework. We were, sh I mean, Anisha and I have been looking at different kinds of ex uh, assessment items across different content areas as well as the grade levels, and then by analyzing those assessments, refining the framework, which actually suggests that it is not either content specific or the grade level specific. So I could easily see that it can uh, apply across different grades as well as different uh, content areas. Thanks, Mariah. TJ, what do you think? Sorry, finding that mute button is hard sometimes. Um, <laughs> so I think that um, with respect to the, the um, shareholder group that we pulled together, we did apply the framework across domains and across grade levels. And what's really interesting about it for me is absolutely it applies across any task that I have um, been able to hold it up against, whether it's a large scale task or um, a classroom level task, because I often evaluate those as well. Um, what's really interesting about this for me is that in Michigan, we have developed a I would have to say a pretty sturdy process of unpacking standards, understanding what content is there, breaking that apart and figuring out how to build our assessments using um, the elements of the various uh, standards that we're putting together and trying to assess. What the complexity framework provides is an even deeper look into this. It's a different and deeper look into this. And so one thing that was really interesting when we pulled our shareholders together was that no matter their domain or um, grade level we were looking at, what the complexity framework drove us to do was dig back in to the framework for K-12 education, the appendices, the standards, the um, evidence statements. We were looking back at all that documentation to try and figure out what complexity we were really asking or what we were really asking students to do in these various tasks. And I think that 
it's it's refreshing to have another tool to help us dig even deeper because I think some of us have gotten a little stuck when it comes to unpacking standards. I think many of us can say we've unpacked until our well closet is empty. And so now this provides another opportunity for us to organize our thinking in a different way. And that has been a really refreshing and enlightening experience for those of us who've had the opportunity to do it. Thanks so much, TJ. Um, and so I think that the sort of the net outcome of both of those responses is that the complexity framework is written to sort of focus on those factors such that you can apply them at a range of grade bands and um, domain areas. At least that's the hope. When we've tried it out on items and tasks, it's worked so far, but um, we encourage you to use it in your own context and tell us how we can um, help, help make sure that we're providing additional tools and supports for that. So I think we have time for one more question, and I, I'm gonna take this question because um, it's a question that I thought about a lot. Uh, the question is about how the cross-cutting concepts are represented in the framework. And for those of you that have downloaded the document, you'll note that there's a, there's a representation of how you might be able to see how items sort of fall into their, um, into the, uh, into different levels of uh, complexity related to the three dimensions. And a question was raised about whether it's ever possible for cross-cutting concepts to sort of fall into that low category. Because if students are using cross-cutting concepts, aren't they always engaging and thinking at a high level? And this is something we really grappled with, was how do the cross-cutting concepts contribute to um, com the complexity of a task? And so I'm gonna tell you where we landed, and this is a conversation we'd love to continue having after the webinar is over. Um, we sort of landed on the cross-cutting concepts are used in a lot of different ways. In assessment tasks, it's sometimes important, so, and sometimes it's important to know that students understand a concept related to the cross-cutting concepts, and that will be the focus of a summative assessment item or cluster. That might be a lower level of complexity than flexibly using the cross-cutting concepts to make, to make sense of something really uncertain. And so that's one way that the cross-cutting concepts can, can contribute to complexity in a lower, in a lower level of sophistication than others. Sometimes the cross-cutting concepts are sort of used to focus student thinking. So think about examples where you see uh, where students are asked to kind of think about a pattern in the data, and that's used to focus their understanding. And then sometimes cross-cutting concepts are used, um, or the student's ability to use the cross-cutting concepts is elicited in a flexible, um, really large sense-making kind of way. Um, and so those, that is not to say that student engagement in the cross-cutting concepts at a high level is not, is not something that we wanna see regularly, but that in an assessment task, there are ways that cross-cutting concepts are elicited from students that can contribute to the overall sense-making at different levels. And sometimes it's simpler sense-making and sometimes it's higher level sense-making, um, but it's relative to how the cross-cutting concepts are processed. So thank you, uh, TJ, for that question, um, because I think that it's a really important one. And it's one that we, uh, we continue to sort of think through, how do we represent this well? And um, what does it look like? And I think as assessments evolve, um, we'll also see, um, we might see some evolution of that in the framework as well. And so with that, I'm gonna say um, thank you for joining us today for this uh, really interesting hour. Your questions have been fabulous and we're really excited to continue engaging them. Um, if you're available tonight, there will be a Twitter chat, um, an NGSS chat at 9 p.m. Eastern to continue discussing the complexity framework. And that might be a great place to raise some of these additional questions with um, colleagues and friends. So thank you again um, for spending some time with us today and I hope you have a wonderful rest of your day.